But um, Kate's trained in biological anthropology at Cambridge, nutritional science, uh, sciences at Cornell University, and epidemiology at U uh, UC uh, Berkeley. She's currently professor of epidemiology in the Department of Health Sciences at York University and the university's research champion for justice and equality. Kate is a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts and a fellow of the UK Faculty of Public Health. She's a co-author with Richard Wilkinson of The Spirit Level, Why More Equal Societies Almost Always Do Better. And that very impressively was chosen as one of the top 10 books of the decade by the New Statesman. It was winner of the publication of the year by the Political Studies Association and translated into 26 languages. And the Inner Level, another book published by Penguin in 2018, um, and again, Kate's also a co-founder of the Equality Trust. One programme of her research focuses on the social determinants of health, including the influences of such factors as social class, income inequality, neighbourhood context and ethnic density on such varied outcomes as mortality and morbidity, teenage birth, obesity, sudden infant death syndrome and health-related behaviours. A second research agenda focuses on smoking in pregnancy, its causal role in relation to behavioural problems in children and its psychological context. So the title of her presentation you can see is How More Equal Societies Reduce Stress, Restore Sanity and Improve Everybody's Well-Being. So I'll now hand you over to Kate. very much for that introduction. It's a bit off-putting, isn't it? Um, I think the most important thing to realise is that Richard and I feel that we can write about these issues because we experience them ourselves, and that is far more important than any degrees or training or awards or, or whatever, because basically we're trying to understand the ways in which society affects all of us, um, and so it's important, I think, to have that human understanding far more than it is to have any kind of ologies um, in your toolkit. So, as mentioned, about 10 years ago, Richard Wilkinson and I published a book called The Spirit Level, which was about the impact of income inequality, you know, disparities in income, the gap between rich and poor, showing that that was related to a wide range of health and social problems. So where problems um, were higher, there was more income inequality. And that was very sort of consistent across a very wide range of issues. And we showed that those effects are very large. They can't be explained just by what's happening to the poor. They're much too big for that. Um, it means we're all affected. And we were able to show that if you are well-educated, reasonably affluent of a high social class, you would still be more likely to experience health and other problems if you lived in a more unequal society compared to a more equal one. So Richard and I are epidemiologists. There's an ologist for you, which simply means that we study the distribution and determinants of disease in populations. But the methods we use to do that are statistical. And what we found is that a lot of people don't like statistics. They don't like graphs and tables and charts. They don't like equations. And we were told that for every equation you put in a book that's intended for the general public, you'll probably lose 10,000 readers. <laughs> Stephen Hawking was warned of this, apparently. Um, he still chose to put one in his brief history of time, E equals MC squared. But we went one better, no equations in our spirit level book. And we made a big effort to fill it with figures that people would be able to understand. Um, we felt you know, reasonably sure that we had done that, but then we found on a Google image search this one, which is so much better than anything we had managed to produce. When Richard saw this, he said it encapsulated you know, more than 40 years of hard intellectual labor. <laughs> so if you can understand this chart, you can understand everything I'm going to show you. Um, problems increase as inequality rises. So, slightly more complicated one. 
This one is looking at different countries. Don't worry if you can't see it very well at the back. Every dot on that chart is a different, rich, developed country. They're arranged with the countries with low levels of inequality on the left and the high inequality countries on the right. And we're looking at a measure of inequality in relation to an index of health and social problems. So that index includes health measures like life expectancy, infant mortality, mental illness and obesity. It also includes things that are to do with children's life chances, teenage pregnancies, educational scores, um, social mobility, and also things to do with what relationships are like in society, levels of trust, the homicide rate, the level of imprisonment. And if we look at all of those things together, we find that countries with more inequality, those on the right, have a higher level of health and social problems. So the three countries at the top up there are the UK, Portugal, and the USA. And the countries that are more equal and are doing better down here on the left include Japan and the Scandinavian countries. So we knew that this would be controversial stuff, right? Inequality is a deeply political issue. And we knew that some people might find this challenging and think that perhaps we'd picked those problems just to suit ourselves. So we did it all again with somebody else's index of well-being, and we chose the UNICEF index of child well-being, which UNICEF publishes every few years for rich countries, comparing levels of child well-being in different rich countries. The first time they published it, in 2007, it caused quite a ruckus here in the UK because we came bottom. The worst child well-being among rich developed countries. They've published it several times since, and every time Richard and I have shown that this measure of, in, of child well-being is significantly linked to income inequality as well. And that index of child well-being contains about 40 components every time. Everything from where the children eat their fruits and vegetables, get on well with their peers, have had their vaccinations, etc. Um, these data are from the 2013 report. We're not at the bottom anymore, but we're still low down. The UK just above the line, Portugal and the USA, having worse child well-being than the Scandinavian countries. We also knew people might think, well, maybe we just chose those countries to suit our own purposes. So we repeated everything with the 50 US states. And we find the same thing when we're looking across those 50 US states. More health and social problems in more unequal states. And that shows that it can't be due to just some cultural differences or differences in welfare regimes between these different countries. It's something more profound. Since then, we've also been able to show that changes in inequality are linked to changes in outcomes. So again, here we're looking at that UNICEF index of child well-being. So countries at the top have higher levels of child well-being and countries at the bottom lower. But we're looking at change in well-being this time, related to change in inequality. So countries that became a bit more unequal over a 10-year period down here on the right, they saw their child well-being decline. Sweden is notable there. Sweden has the fastest growing inequality within the OECD countries and has seen its child well-being decline. Over on the left here, countries near the top, child well-being improved a bit as income inequality levels fell a little. And the UK is up there in that quadrant. Please note, however, that these data do not run past 2010. And the picture in the United Kingdom of child well-being is of declining levels of child well-being since 2010 with the introduction of austerity. But that's another crisis. There has been a lot of research which helps us feel you know, that the picture we've shown is a causal one, not just changes like the one that I've just shown you, but also new studies from other people studying new kinds of outcomes, helping us to really understand what's going on. Here's school bullying. Different researcher, our colleague Frank Elgar from Canada, different set of countries, but kids bully each other more in more unequal societies. I mentioned that those effects are large, and so I just want to show you one example of that. These are imprisonment rates. 
um, prisoners per 100,000 people in the population. And in the more equal countries, so we've got Scandinavian countries and Japan again, there are about 50 people in prison for every 100,000. Now this graph, I'm going to be a tiny bit technical here, okay? This graph has got a very weird scale. It's got a log scale at the side here, which means the distance from 10 to 100 at the side is the same as from 100 to 1,000. And we've had to put this chart on a log scale because otherwise we couldn't fit the USA on it. Because in the USA, there are um, over 600 people in prison for every 100,000 of the population. Now, some people think that inequality doesn't matter. Inequalities of outcome don't matter as long as everybody's got equality of opportunity. Well, you can already guess from what I've shown you about child well-being that that's unlikely to be the case in unequal countries. But we've now got strong and convincing evidence from a whole range of countries that social mobility is lower <coughs> in more unequal societies. Um, the USA is that purple one sort of in the middle there. And among the rich developed countries, it has the lowest social mobility. So it's not the land of opportunity. We often say, if you want to live the American dream, you should probably go to Denmark. <laughs> so the evidence base over the past 10 years, it's been growing more and more robust, lots more studies, lots of them looking at changes in inequality over time, trying to figure out how long it takes for when inequality changes have an impact on the health of the population. But our social context has been changing as well. And for those of you who were here this morning, you had a talk on our mental health crisis in the UK. And what Richard and I have been really trying to understand in these last few years are the psychological pathways through which income inequality is causing all of these different outcomes. If it's affecting our health, then it must be through chronic stress. What, why are we chronically stressed? If it's affecting violence, then that's a behavioural thing as well. Why are people more prone to violence? And we're really trying to understand why the world doesn't look like this, right? Why we're not all happy, shiny people, connected to one another, fulfilled and prosperous, and why instead real life looks more like this. <laughs> now, that first picture is deceptive, really, because it's an advert for a psychotherapy clinic. <laughs> so they're probably not quite as happy as they're making out. Um, but this, this, is, this one's real life. These are young people outside Oxford Street tube station. They're on their way to work. They're all employed. They're probably physically healthy. They are disconnected from each other. They are miserable uniformly. Some look angry. Some look tearful. But they certainly all look miserable. And the data suggests that's a more accurate picture of our life. Last year, the Mental Health Foundation found that 74% um, of us, and three quarters of us, say that we felt so overwhelmed by stress at some point in the past year that we can't cope. 32% of adults, so nearly a third, had suicidal feelings as a result of stress. And 16% of adults had self-harmed. And the figures are much higher for our young people. So we have a true epidemic of self-harm and mental health problems in, our, in all of us, but particularly among our young people. And so it's been trying to understand why we're in that situation and how income inequality causes this level of dysfunction in society that that's what our new book is focused on. Um, so our new book is called The Inner Level. This is the American cover. Um, the British cover has a peacock and a pigeon on it, which is, which is quite nice, but apparently um, Americans don't buy books that have frivolous covers. Uh, you know, if they, if they are going to read a serious non-fiction book, they want it to look like a serious <laughs> non-fiction book. So we asked our American editor, you know, about this and showed him the British one with the peacock and the pigeon and said, what did you think? And he said, well, it looks either like poetry or a crime thriller. Um, so we have a much more boring cover in the United States. And it, what we're doing in our new book is showing how income inequality undermines our feelings of self-worth and damages mental health. And that's what I'm going to focus on 
for the rest of my talk today. We also spend some time, though, in the book, busting a couple of popular myths that people hold and that allow them to tolerate high levels of inequality in society. And one is the myth that we're always going to have inequality because it's just human nature. You can't change it. We are nasty, competitive, aggressive individuals out for ourselves. And we show that that's not the case. We're actually incredibly flexible, adaptable, and can be egalitarian, reciprocal, caring, sharing human beings. But inequality shapes the way we develop and behave. And there's also an idea that if we have high levels of inequality, that's just due to differences in people's talents and capabilities. The clever, the smart, the the hardworking, the lazy, the stupid drift down. And we show that that's not true either. And that the links between social position and capabilities are shaped by inequality and they're not a result of them. And we also, and this is very important if we're thinking about crisis, spend time showing how we need to reduce inequality if we're going to tackle climate change. For two reasons. One is because we consume more in more unequal societies, and I'll show you a little bit of that. But the other is, it, we need to be able to provide a quality of life for people that will enable them to get on board with making the changes in our economy and our societies that we need to deal with climate change. But I'm really going to focus just on the first of those bullet points. And really, all we're doing is comparing societies that have a very steep social hierarchy and ones that have a shallow one. Societies where some people are valued tremendously more than other people, and societies where that is less so. And one of the things that has inspired us to think about this was a study um, done by a sociologist called Robert Walker, who looked at the experience of poverty in different countries. And he and his colleagues talked to poor people in a number of different countries, rich countries and poor countries. Countries as poor as India, which is here on the right, where if you're poor, it's likely you live in slum conditions, probably without sanitation, water, um, probably inadequate access to food and other things. And countries like the UK and Norway, where being poor probably means you've got central heating and adequate shelter, etc. although we see those problems um, of homelessness and food insecurity on the rise in Britain, of course. But the key finding from this study was that people's experience of poverty was exactly the same in all those different places. So people who were poor felt ashamed and humiliated. They felt that they had tried hard but had not been able to get themselves out of poverty. They blamed themselves. Wives blamed their husbands, children blamed their parents. Schools were seen as an engine of making this worse, of judging children and making them feel their poverty. So it didn't matter how much income or material standards people had, their experience of poverty was the same. And this, this is a clue to how inequality affects us. Because in a more unequal society, status matters more, class matters more, your social position matters more. And so experiencing relative poverty in those situations is worse. And of course, we're all susceptible to insecurities about our status, anxieties about where we come. This is behind some of our excessive consumption of status goods and our wish to show that through the first class things we own, we are not second or third class people. I'm very amused by this picture. Um, for those of you who don't keep up with designer logos, this is a Louis Vuitton rubbish bag. <laughs> so if you want to show that you, you know, you're classier than your neighbors, you can probably get a pack of those. Now, we already knew that mental illness was more common in more unequal societies. Um, these data are from our previous book. We didn't have data for that many countries um, where you could really compare levels of mental illness. But for those that we did have, there's a strong relationship. 
So less than or around 10% of the population in more equal countries have had some kind of mental illness in the past year. But for us in Britain, it's 23% of us. This is with, you know, a clinical level of mental illness and more than a quarter in the USA. And at the time, we could only guess, academics call it theorizing, but it's really just guessing. We could only sort of guess why that is true. And we were using data from psychological experiments that showed people feel um, the most anxiety when they're in situations where other people can judge them, judge their self-worth. We were looking at some monkey experiments. We were looking at experiments where kids were made to feel aware of their social status and then see how they performed in tests. And that convinced us that more unequal societies were probably seeing more mental illness because more people were worried about their status. But we hadn't shown it. And a few years after we published our book, we were at the University of Chicago, where I used to teach. And they're quite brutal at the University of Chicago. They sort of pride themselves on, on being cross in seminars, you know, and not letting you get past <coughs> three slides without a question. And we presented that, and then someone said, well, it's all very well you guessing this, you know, but you've not shown that anxieties about status are higher in more unequal countries. Now, somebody else has. All right, this is a slightly tricky one, okay? So here we're looking at levels of status anxiety at the side, higher up, more anxieties about status. And we're looking at the poorest people in different countries and the richest people. So we're looking right across the income distribution. So all the lines go downwards you're less anxious about your status if you're rich, wherever you live. But then the three lines are for European countries with low inequality at the bottom, medium inequality in the middle, and high inequality at the top. So in a high inequality country, a more unequal country, everybody worries more about their status, whether they're rich or poor. The effects are largest at the bottom, but they go all the way to the top. And I think that was hugely helpful in us feeling that what we were thinking was sort of on the right track. But there's been other stuff that's helped us as well. Um, we do like a good monkey study, because you can learn an awful lot from, from studies of other animals. Um, animals have dominance systems and dominance hierarchies. You know, animals sort themselves out into these hierarchies and behave in ways that are determined by their position in society. And it turns out that we have inherited something called the dominance behavioral system from our animal predecessors. I mean, the dominance behavioral system, you can find it in crayfish. So it's not just you know, unique to um, the higher primates, but you can certainly find it in us. And a psychologist at the University of California, Sherry Johnson and her colleagues, looked at the literature on mental illness, looking for signs and symptoms that mental illness was linked to this dominance behavioral system. So the dominance behavioral system, it's how our brains and our hormones and everything works to shape our behavior in relationships where there's some kind of difference of power. So every time we meet someone new, apparently we assess each other's status within a blink of an eye and we behave appropriately. And what she found was that people who had signs and bio, biological markers um, of dominance tended to have more mental illnesses like schizophrenia, psychosis, and narcissism. And people who had signs of submission were more likely to have depression and anxiety. What Sherry Johnson and her colleagues didn't realize was that those conditions are more prevalent in some countries than others. I don't think they were thinking about there being differences between countries in whether people or not would adopt dominant or submissive strategies. We got in touch with her, and we were able to do some work together. And it's now very clear that actually inequality creates more of both of those kinds of responses. So it creates more depression, more feelings of lack of self-worth, low self-esteem, um, worries, anxieties, and depression. 
And so we see an increase in depression in more unequal countries and here in more unequal United <coughs> States. But we also see, see more of that dominant response, that opposite response. Does this remind anybody <laughs> of anybody? Um, we see more of a tendency towards self-aggrandizement and people claiming they're better than others um, and trying to, sort of, in Britain, we say, big themselves up. And so we find that self-enhancement is more common in more unequal societies. And self-enhancement is thinking that you're kind of better than everybody else. So it's a bit like um, that, that um, some of you listen to that program from American public radio called Lake Wobegon Ever, where all of the children are above average. It's sort of that, that notion. And we know that in some societies, people are more likely to think they're better than other people. So in America, 96% of the population think that they are better drivers than average. In Sweden, it's only 66%, which is still too high, but it's a little better. Um, this study looked at these kinds of measures in samples of the population, um, and they asked people, do you think you're more intelligent than the average person in your society? Do you think you're a nicer person? Do you think you're better looking? You know, all of these different ways. And in more unequal countries, people were more likely to self-enhance. And so you won't be surprised to see that if we look at a measure of narcissism, um, and that is spelled wrong. I do apologize. Our French editor noticed that. Nobody else had noticed it for months. But narcissism rose over time, looking from the 1980s through to the mid 2000s, um, as income inequality rose as well. You can't use standard measures of self esteem with American young people anymore because they all score at the maximum. <laughs> And schizophrenia is more common in more unequal countries, as are psychotic symptoms. But some people big themselves up, some people go under with depression and anxiety, but of course some people find other ways to cope. So we know that um, deaths from illegal drug use and illegal drug use and deaths from alcohol-related liver disease are higher in more unequal countries. Um, we know that gambling, is more common now problem gambling, not just, you know, my kind of little once a year bet on the um, Grand National. Although last year I had a little one on the Derby as well. Um, problem, problem gambling. Um, people are more given to comfort eating, they're more given to sort of um, shopping to overcome their feelings of self-doubt. And so consumerism is on the rise in more unequal countries. And there are studies now that show in more unequal countries and in more unequal US states, people are more likely to spend a lot of money on a car, search online for designer goods, buy status things as well. And if you can't afford the status goods, you can actually just buy the bags. Um, I found this on eBay. So if you can't afford the Louis Vuitton rubbish bags. You can go on eBay and you can buy somebody else's used designer carrier bags. Living the dream. Um, and because of this, we see household debt rising over time. The green line is debt. The blue line is inequality. Data from the United States. Advertisers know we're more susceptible in more unequal countries. They spend more per head of population on advertising to us. And it works, doesn't it? They make us want things that we don't need. But things happen to broader society as well. And I think, I think perhaps this is where there's as much a crisis in the UK as there is around the mental health issues. What inequality does to our social fabric, how it divides us and tears us apart, the social distances, that it creates between us. We know that civic participation declines in more unequal societies. That's things like coming to an event like this, voting, um, reading newspapers, joining local groups. All of those things decline in more unequal countries. 
cultural participation declines as well. You know, people are less likely to go to a museum or the theatre. Trust declines. Levels of trust fall with higher levels of inequality. And that's generalised trust. So that's, you know, do you trust other people? Um, and that affects all of our interactions in public spaces, on public transport, school playgrounds, in the workplace. Homicides rise. These are data for US states and Canadian provinces. Tenfold differences in homicide rates related to inequality. And we know how low self-esteem and feeling that you're not being respected is the most common trigger to violence. And then if you go to countries that are much more unequal than the ones we tend to study, the rich developed countries, you can see that this process has gone even further. So this is a photo from Cuenavaca in Mexico where we went to do, to do some work. And this is very typical of a street in Mexico. Barbed wire on the fences, shuttered windows, people afraid to go out. Um, at night, people afraid to sort of walk on the streets, afraid to let their young people go out together. Um, here's South Africa. It's even worse. We've now got an electric fence across the top. A notice saying armed response. If you try to get in, somebody will shoot you. And very, very vaguely in the back, there's some really big dogs. Um, so in societies where everybody's becoming really, you know, everything's very much more unequal, people are becoming afraid of one another. And they barricade themselves off from one another. This is symbolised by gated communities as well. It's symbolised by people wanting to segregate their children from other children and send them for private and exclusive education. It's symbolised by many of the ways in which people segregate themselves from one another, shut themselves off from one another, and fear people who are not like them. And we see that in more unequal countries, a higher proportion of the population are employed in what's called guard labour, so police, security, etc., the army. And so people are being paid to sort of reinforce those, those distances between us. So are we having a crisis of inequality? We are. Um, we are now as unequal as we were back towards the beginning of the 20th century. Sometimes you might hear on the radio or, or reading the newspapers people discussing little changes in income inequality. It's gone down a bit this year, up a bit the next year. The key to understanding the effects of inequality in our society is understanding that huge rise we saw starting in 1979, which has never been undone. And that's a typical pattern in many Western countries, unleashed by neoliberalism, deregulation, um, the idea that income inequality was just a sort of necessary byproduct of economic growth. And in the end, it would all trickle down and everybody would be OK. That didn't happen, actually. You've probably noticed. So we're at very high levels of inequality, and we're not doing anything to tackle them. And I think they're now starting to have an impact on our societies beyond um, the kinds of things that as epidemiologists, or sociologists, or psychologists we tend to study, and more into the realm of political science. So I'm just going to show you one last graph. This comes from The Economist. And they were responding to a challenge. Somebody had said, what factor best explains the swing to Trump in the last US presidential election? And what they, so the swing to Trump is at the side, so the dots at the top are swinging away from the Democrats to the Republicans. And the factor that they found explained it best was a measure of what's basically health inequality. Counties with lower life expectancy, more obesity and diabetes, heavy drinking and low exercise were more likely to vote for a president who was vowing to remove their right to health care. In the UK, I think if we look at our Brexit vote, we can see the damage done by inequality and the ways in which people feel left behind. Some areas of the country, some sections of our population, feel that government isn't 
doing things in their best interests, want to change things, want to send a message. And I was recently sent a paper by two economists um, from America showing that in more unequal U US places and more unequal European countries, people are more likely to vote for populist parties in elections. So I think inequalities are now can be seen as a direct threat to our democracy, as well as a threat to our population health and well-being, as well as an effect on our children's life chances, as well as an effect on the environment, and an effect on the way we all relate to one another. Now, if you were Margaret Thatcher or Ronald Reagan back in the early 1980s, I think you could be justified in thinking that the choices you were making about the way you were going to change the economy might be beneficial, because there was no evidence to suggest that that was not the case. But now we know. Now we know that inequality is damaging, and so now we need to decide how we're going to turn that around. I'm going to stop talking now, and I'm just going to put up a slide that is the website for our Equality Trust where you can find all kinds of resources um, and ways in which you can join in actions locally, nationally and individually to try and tackle this scourge of inequality.